Chapter 5 has quite a few slides and I know I will not have time to cover all of them, but I would like you to read up the remaining slides of chapter 5 afterwards, even though I would not have time to go over all the slides. Maybe we can have a short discussion one of the later days as time permits on the extra slides. So, what I want to focus on today for in from chapter 5 is the first part, which is accessing SQL from a programming language. Now, there are many programming languages and each of them has its own API for accessing uh, databases from the language. In fact, some of the programming languages have many APIs for accessing databases. So, there is no one single solution to this, but for consistency, we are going to stick to Java and its JDBC API to access databases. A little bit of history, um, Microsoft actually, well even before Microsoft, there was a uh, attempt to standardize this in SQL um, for data, database access. Um, and Microsoft did an implementation which more or less followed the standard, but differed in some ways. And they called it ODBC. So, that was from C language initially, but also basic and a few other languages. And that became kind of a standard and JDBC was modeled after ODBC. So, I am going to focus on this. The remaining parts of the chapter are more on more type schemas, procedural constructs, triggers, advanced aggregation features, including ranking features, which we discussed earlier and online analytical processing. So, let me focus on JDBC. ODBC has the same properties. It is an API for a program to interact with a database server. Now, how many times have you or anybody you known uh, actually typed SQL queries to a database system outside of a database course? Probably hardly ever. Uh, the only people who write SQL queries are programmers and those queries are part of application program and executed whenever the application program is executed. So, it is obviously very important to define how the application program talks to the database. So, the basic sequence of steps, whichever API you use is to first connect to the database server through the network, send SQL commands to the database server and fetch results. If you have a single result, you can fetch it immediately. If your query has many tuples in the result, you have to fetch them one by one or, or block by block or whatever other way and then output them to the application user. So, JDBC is the Java language API, which is the standard. So, the way you do stuff in JDBC is you open a connection to the database, then you have to create what is called a statement object and then execute queries using the statement object. And then at the end you have to close the statement object, close the connection when you are done. There is also an exception mechanism. If something goes wrong while processing queries, Java has an exception mechanism and the JDBC API uses that to signal errors back to the application program. JDBC like ODBC not only lets you access data, it also lets you access metadata, which is like the schema information and you know what are the views in the database, what are the primary keys, what are the foreign keys, what columns does this relation have. So, all kinds of metadata can be accessed from JDBC also. It turns out that the SQL standard also lets you access metadata through a set of relations. It is called the information schema. Unfortunately, nobody uh, implements it more or less, whereas the JDBC API to get at metadata is standard and everybody implements it. So, this is what most people use to get at metadata. So, here is a small uh, snippet of JDBC code. Uh, I have broken it up into two parts. In this slide, I am just showing you how to establish a connection and the actual work is on the next slide. So, the first step says class dot for name oracle dot JDBC dot driver dot oracle driver. Now, this is a bit confusing to most people. What is this? There is actually there is two ways of uh, doing this. Uh, there is another uh, thing using driver manager. Uh, so I think the assignment uh, will tell you a bit more about the alternatives, but what is this first step? And the answer is the JDBC API like the ODBC API lets each database vendor create their own library 
implementing the JDBC calls. So, what does that mean? You may have a library for SQL Server, you may have a library for PostgreSQL, you may have a library for Oracle. Now, if an application needs to uh, use this library, it should link with that library. Supposing this link is done statically, when you compile the application program, that means that the application can either talk to Oracle or it can talk to SQL Server or to PostgreSQL. You have to decide that at compile time. But what if I want an application which can get data from two different databases, combine them and output it to the user? This would not be possible with static linking. So, in fact, what all these APIs do is they allow you to dynamically load multiple implementations. You can load Oracle and PostgreSQL and SQL Server libraries all at the same time and then depending on which connection you are using, the appropriate library is used. So, how does it do it? First of all, this um, uh, class dot for name tells it to load the Oracle driver. Then when you say driver manager dot get connection, uh, it uses this one which you have just loaded and um, opens a connection to the database. Now, how do you open a connection to the database? First of all, you have to tell the API which machine it is on, that is down here, db.el.edu. You have to tell it which port number the database is running on. In this case, I have said 2000. Uh, actually, each database has a standard port. Um, PostgreSQL runs on port 5432 by default. So, that is what you will be using in uh, over here. Other databases run on other ports by default, but you can change it actually. Okay, so, that is the port number. Then the next part here, UnivDB. A particular Oracle installation can have many databases. In this case, it says connect to UnivDB, same with PostgreSQL. Now, what is the prefix here? JDBC colon Oracle colon thin is basically something which is associated with this fellow. That is, uh, I can load multiple such drivers. Each driver um, will have something identifying what protocol it supports, what specific uh, variant of the uh, implementation of the JDBC protocol it supports. Now, this particular driver would have said it supports the protocol JDBC Oracle thin. Therefore, when you say driver manager dot get connection JDBC Oracle thin, the driver manager knows to use the uh, implementation which is there in this particular thing Oracle driver. What is that Oracle driver? It actually has to be a file in the uh, file system which contains the byte code for the Oracle specific implementation. So, it is going to uh, load that byte code dynamically and then this one says use that particular one because you may have loaded three different ones. So, it'll, this tells which one to use. So, that is how you tell the connection manager to open a specific connection to a specific database. Once you open the connection, the next step is to create a statement on that connection and you use that statement to do the actual work. You will not refer to the connection late subsequently, you will only refer to the statement. And finally, you can close the statement, close the connection and that is done. And at any point, you can have an exception. So, this uh, catches SQL exception, that is the type of the exception that JDBC throws. So, this catches all SQL exceptions and then prints the error message. It prints a string followed by SQLE, that object itself is simply going to convert the error message into text and output it. So, you know what went wrong. So, the actual work in your, you know, maybe it could not open the connection, that will be an exception. Maybe when it was doing actual querying, there was an error, that would also get caught and be displayed. Okay. So, now let us see how to do actual work on the database. So, the first example is to update a database by inserting something into the database. So, here we have a piece of code which again encloses the work in a try catch. So, that if the update fails, you can immediately say sorry the update failed. So, what is the update here? I am trying to insert a tuple for this particular guy 77987 with the name Kim, physics department, some salary into instructor. 
So, I am passing an entire SQL string here to statement dot execute update and it is going to execute that and it as long as everything works there is no exception it is fine. If something fails why would it fail? Maybe it violated a foreign key constraint maybe 77987 is already there. So, it will reject it. Maybe there was a constraint on salary uh, which does not allow 98000 as salary perhaps it is rejected. Maybe the physics department does not exist it is a foreign key violation it is rejected. So, many possible reasons are there and when I print this here the SQLE that will actually contain a specific message saying what went wrong. So, that is important. So, that was an update. Now, the queries are slightly different because they actually have to return multiple answers potentially. So, the interface is slightly different here. Here I say statement dot execute query and I pass a query string to it. So, what is this string? It says select department name average salary from instructor group by department name. So, this is going to find for each department which has some instructor the average salary of instructors. Now, obviously, this query has one row potentially per department. So, the result of this query is not a single value, but it is a set of tuples. So, in JDBC the result is an object of type result set. So, I am assigning the result to this object R set whose type is result set. So, this is a variable. So, once this is executed I can fetch the results one by one using the R set object. So, how do I fetch a result? I have to do R set dot next to fetch the first tuple and I keep doing next, next, next it will get second, third, fourth and so on. What if the next failed because there is no more tuple then the R set dot next would return false. So, we put this in a loop which says while R set dot next. So, if the result is empty what happens R set dot next returns false immediately. So, the loop never executes. If the result had two tuples the first time it would succeed go process it the next loop would fetch the next tuple process it the third time around it will try to fetch it fails and exits the loop. So, this loop is only executed when next succeeded and what is the content of the loop doing is doing system dot out dot print line r set dot get string department name plus r set dot get float 2. So, what is this stuff? r set dot get string department name gets for the current row. So, note that result set is a set of rows, but when I am doing next, next, next at each point there is a current row. I am at the first row, second, third, fourth at wherever current row I am at r set dot get string department name will get the department name attribute of that row. Note that uh, JDBC has somehow found out that this query result its first column is called department name therefore, it can fetch that value. Now, the second column what is the name of the second column? Second column is an aggregate its name is database dependent. So, I do not know what that name will be JDBC will know, but I do not know as a programmer. So, what I do instead is I say r set dot get float 2 which means the second attribute. So, I do not care about its name get the value of the second attribute. Note I am doing get float because I know this attribute is a number it is average of something. What if I do get string on this? Well, luckily JDBC actually converts a floating point number to a string. So, I can do get string on it it will still work. What if I do get float on department name? It will be a runtime error it will say sorry department name is physics I cannot convert that to a floating point. So, JDBC tries to convert types as required depending on whether you do get string get float and so on. If it can uh, if the type matches no problem if the type does not match it will try to convert if it succeeds fine otherwise it raises an exception. So, uh, as we just saw I can get an attribute either by attribute name or by position. So, since department name is the first attribute in the result 
R s dot get string department name and R s dot get string one are really the same thing. So, so far so good. Now, what if a particular value in the database happened to be null? Now, if it was a string value and I do get string, it can return null, that is not a problem. But what if it is an integer or a float? I said get float. Now, null is not a valid uh, type, uh, value for floating point types in Java. So, it cannot give any meaningful uh, result there. So, what it will do is if the value is null, it will give you some result, um, but in addition it is going to set a flag that that value was null, whatever value you fetched last was null. So, if you want to see if it was null, then moment uh, right after you say get int or get float or whatever attribute value, you say check if r s dot was null. What does that mean? The last value you fetched was null. If it was null, then you know that the value you got was null. The actual assignment here a might get 0, it might get min int, it may get something, we do not know what it gets, depends on the implementation. But when I do this check, I know that a was null and I can deal with it in explicitly in Java. Okay. So, that was a quick uh, overview of part of JDBC. Uh, there is a question here, but I think I will defer it just a moment and come back to it after finishing up with JDBC. Okay. So, so far we saw that we can execute a update or a query which is a string. Now, most applications require uh, input from the user which they need to stick into a query. The correct way of doing it is as follows. If I am going to get an input from a user which has for example, a student name, student ID, course ID, whatever input I get from the user, I can create a query template, a query template which has question marks wherever I intend to put values. So, this is the correct way of doing it. So, what do you do? In the earlier insert, now I am going to say insert into instructor values question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. So, these are placeholders. I cannot actually uh, execute this query right now. Instead, what I do is I say connection dot prepare statement with this statement. So, the statement is prepared, but it cannot execute because we do not have values for the question mark. So, after preparing, I can do the following. Uh, on the same prepared, the result is a prepared statement object. And on that prepared statement object, I can set the values. So, I have set the ID to the string 888777. I have set the second one, which is the name to Perry. I have set the third one, which is the department to finance. And the fourth one, which is the salary to uh, 1 lakh 25,000. The finance guys always get paid the most these days. And after setting all the values for these four question marks, I can do p statement dot execute update with no further parameters. So, it is going to fill in the values and execute it. This is the correct way of passing parameters taken from the user, user input, maybe a keyboard or if it is a web application through the browser across the net to your application. This is how you will put it in the database. Similarly, if you are running a query which takes parameters, so I want to find uh, all people in a specified department, the user enters the department name, I want to find all people in that department. So, similarly, I will have a query with a question mark for the department name uh, and same prepare state. This part is exactly the same. I can set the parameter value exactly the same. The only difference is here, instead of execute query uh, update, I will do result set equal to execute query, uh, p statement dot execute query. So, that returns a result set just like we saw before. Now, here is a warning which you should take very, very, very seriously because this has enormous security implications. Whenever you take input from a user, always use prepared statements to pass that value to the database. Whether it is a update or a query does not matter, use prepared statements. A lot of people lot of programmers that I have seen, whether it is students or even many program new uh, professionals who have not yet learnt what not to do, do the following. They have got 
let us say um, you know ID name, department name and balance input from the user. So, they will create an SQL query dynamically, they will say insert into instructor values, open uh, parenthesis, single quote and then the string closes plus ID which was entered by the user plus in the in inside our double quotes, single quote comma quote. So, what is this doing? It is taking the user input and creating an SQL query, putting a quote around each attribute over here, um, except for the last uh, attribute balance, um, which is actually uh, uh, not, not a balance, I am sorry, this should have been uh, salary. Salary is an integer, so that one is not quoted, the others are all quoted. Now, there is a major problem with this query. Supposing I try to insert a person called D'Souza with a quote after the D, what happens? Name comes here and I get a open quote which starts the name D quote which is the quote from D'Souza and what does SQL think? It thinks that the name is ended, quote D quote is a name and after that is Souza. Now, this does not make sense to SQL and it gives an error and uh, it does not store anything in the database, it is an error. Um, so, we uh, 10 years ago when we first started using JDBC, we did not realize this and we had an application which would load a lot of names and it would fail on names with quotes, that is when we realized what is going wrong. Um, but sometimes people build applications, do not even check for errors. For example, in IITB's uh, MTech admission system, we store the college name from where they graduated. Now, this uh, actually failed for a lot of people because in Bombay, we have a lot of uh, Christian college, Father Agnell's college, St. Xavier's college, you know so many colleges with single quotes and guess what happened? All of them had a syntax error and those updates never happened and worse still the programmer uh, in the try catch, they simply output a message to some log and nobody knew it had gone wrong, it just went to a log and that was it, nobody saw the logs. So, eventually when we went around looking at colleges, we found many, many students did not have a college name associated with them and it was because of this error. So, that is innocuous, it was not, it is bad, but not horrible. Well, here is the horrible part, which is called SQL injection uh, vulnerability. So, let us take a simpler query, which is select star from instructor, where name equal to single quote, close the string plus name plus in double quotes a single quote. So, it is constructing an SQL query with a name input by the user. Supposing uh, the user types the following, instead of entering a meaningful name, the user says um, enters x quote, this is just from a web application, there is a box to enter a name. So, the user types x quote or quote y quote equal to quote y quote. Now, what is this doing? The name string is going to end with x, where it says select star from instructor, where name equal to x. Now, that is going to fail, no instructor has name x probably, but the constructed SQL now continues, it does not end there. It says or y equal to y, which is obviously going to be true. So, what is this query going to do now? It is going to output all the instructor names, which is not what the programmer intended. Well, that does not sound so bad, um, but the user could have done something much, much more dangerous. The user could have typed x quote semicolon. What does semicolon do? It terminates that string at the query. Following that can be a new query. That query could be update instructor set salary equal to salary plus 10,000. So, it this uh, very generous hacker has just given a 10,000 rupee raise to all instructors. Hey, all of us are instructors, we may be very happy with this, uh, we may not mind, uh, but somebody minds and could get a lot worse. Uh, the hacker could be a student who did not like instructors and sets their salary to 0 or sets the salary to something slightly lower, which you would not even notice on your pay slip. All kinds of bad things can happen. Worse still, the hacker could delete all the relations in the database, nothing prevents it. 
they can cause enormous damage all from just sitting at a web browser and typing some funny strings where text was expected, strings with single quotes and SQL constructs. If they know what they are doing, they can cause enormous havoc. And in fact, um, this problem was so under recognized that apparently many uh, department stores in the US and uh, even some of the credit card processing companies, they had web applications which were vulnerable to this problem. The web application may have done something very simple like allow users to check their balance, nothing, no updates. But in there, there was a SQL injection vulnerability. These guys went in there and started messing around with the database. And there is a very famous case which uh, was published in New York Times a month ago, where these guys hacked into the credit card company databases and got a huge number of credit and debit card numbers. The moment they got a debit card number or credit card with a pin, they actually captured the pin number even, which you enter at uh, various places. Now, they could go and manufacture cards of their own and go to an ATM and withdraw money. They actually did this. They made a lot of money using this. In fact, it was a more complex operation. These guys extracted it and went and sold the information to somebody in Russia. These guys were in the US. They sold it to somebody in Russia. So, these guys stopped going to ATM machines themselves. The guys in Russia used the ATM machines, but they transferred money back to these guys. So, it, to make the connection, you actually had to go find who did it in Russia, come back to US, police in two countries involved. It was actually very difficult to catch them. They did catch these guys, but who knows how many more people got away with it. So, what is the moral of the story? We as people writing queries in JDBC or equivalently ODBC or any other language, it is the same, the problem is the same. If you construct strings like this from user inputs, you are asking for disaster. There are tools which you can run, commercial tools, which will try to probe your system to look for vulnerabilities like this. Uh, so, you should probably use those tools, but in the first place, you should not make this error. So, people should realize they should never ever concatenate user input to form a query. They should use prepared statements. What is the difference if you use a prepared statement? Well, the system knows about quotes, it can deal with it, it can put in escape characters and so on. So, that at the end what goes to the database is a properly formatted query. So, if somebody typed St. Xavier's College, that would work. If somebody tried to hack the system, uh, well that entire complex SQL query they constructed will simply go in as a field in the database and their attempt is defeated. So, that is the moral of this story. So, it is really important. I find many people making this mistake. Even after being told in my course this semester, I found about 25 percent of students making this mistake and I should have probably failed them in the lab. I did not have the heart to do it, but I scolded them severely. Okay. So, um, now here is a quiz question. Let me take the, there is one more quiz question which I postponed, but let me take it out of order. Let me do this question now, because it is a continuation. So, all of you please press your ST buttons and be ready for this quiz question. I am giving you about 15 seconds to press your ST button. Okay. The timer has started now. Please do not press the ST buttons anymore. Press your answer only at this point. So, uh, oh wait, I did not explain the question. I am sorry, let us, can, can you cancel this? Okay. I am going to ignore this, because I forgot to tell you what is the question. One minute is not enough to read this question. So, do not bother answering this quiz. Forget it. I am going to run this quiz again. So, let me explain the question first. So, the question is, here is this piece of code, which uses a prepared statement. I just told you, you should be using prepared statements. So, a few students uh, went ahead and wrote code like this, prepared statement p statement equal to connection dot prepared statement, select star from instructor where name equal to single quote plus name plus single quote and then did uh, results at r s is p statement dot execute query and then went ahead and fetched results from it. The question is, is the above code secure? And the possible answers are, 
A, yes, it is secure since we are using prepared statements. I told you to use prepared statements, so everything is fine. Um, B is no, we are still concatenating strings, so SQL injection can still occur. C is yes, it is secure since we are using execute query, and D is no, it is not secure since we are using execute query. So, you have these four options. I am going to start the quiz again, just uh, hang on for a moment. Press your ST keys at this point to prepare your remotes, I am giving you 10 seconds. Quiz should be enabled now, check that the red lights are blinking or blinking right, they should be blinking on your remote. Please press option uh, 1 through 4. You should be able to see the timer counting down in the video feed. Okay, time is up. So, let me explain the answer and then we will see what people have uh, responded. So, the answer A is wrong. Prepared statements are not magic. If you create a string by concatenating user input and then prepare that, the database still thinks it is a query with multiple parts. So, uh, if the string uh, had quotes, it is very much going to run into the same SQL injection problems. Just because you replaced uh, execute query by a prepared statement does not make any difference if you still concatenate strings. I found a lot of students earlier on would get confused by this. That is why I raised this question. B is no, we are, since we are still concatenating strings using user input, SQL injection can still occur and that is the correct answer. Uh, C and D are wrong, uh, it is certainly not secure and the D is execute query has nothing to do with being secure. The point is you should not be concatenating strings on your own, you should be using question mark uh, placeholders for user input and then use prepared statement dot set string set int as uh, depending on the type. So, the answer is B and let us see the responses. Okay. This time more centers have worked, only about 4 or 5 centers are left. 177 people have responded out of 300, it is better and audience wins this time. I am happy that audience has won, um, good. So, B was the right answer. Uh, it is still, uh, you know, the losers can form a coalition government and topple the right answer still. Uh, because they have enough numbers, uh, but still the major, the most frequent one was the correct answer. Uh, so, quite a few had the same error which I saw in many students. They think that just because you stuck a prepared statement, it solves the problems. No, not only should you use prepared statement, you should not concatenate strings using user input. That is the bottom line. Okay. Now, a uh, quick overview of uh, metadata features in JDBC. JDBC lets you look at what are the relations in a database, what are the uh, columns in a query result and so on. So, there are two interfaces. The first one is called result set metadata. So, when you run a query, you would like to know how many columns are there in the result, what are the names of the columns, what are the types and result set metadata is something which lets you see the metadata about a query result. So, after you have executed a query, you have got a result set rs, I can say rs dot get metadata. That returns an object of type result set metadata. On that object, I can uh, step through uh, you know the uh, how many ever it has a column count, how many columns it has and then I can get the name of the ith column using get column name. I can get the type of the ith column by getting uh, get column type name and then there are a few more. So, all of this lets me see the names and types. This is how an interface like um, PG admin 3, if you manage to get it working, when you run a query, it will show you the column names followed by the actual data. So, it figured out the column names using result set metadata. Actually, PG admin 3 is not written in JDBC Java, but if it were, it would have used this. It uses an equivalent feature with uh, ODBC. 
Similarly, you have database metadata, which lets you find what are all the relations in the database, what are their attributes, what are the types of the attributes. Uh, and I have not shown all of it here, but you can even find what are the constraints, primary key, foreign key constraints. So, there is a whole bunch of features, which let you view all details of the schema using different API calls. So, the simplest one is uh, on the connection get metadata, which lets returns a database metadata object. From that object, you can get columns, uh, which match a certain thing. For example, um, univ db department relation percent, which means all columns, regardless of the name. I can put filters here and it gets those columns. So, from the result of that is column name, column type and so on with one row per column. So, why is this useful? Well, there are many reasons. If I want a database browser, I need to know what are the tables in the database. I need to know what are the columns of that table. I need to know what are the primary key constraints, foreign key constraints on that table. So, again, in PG admin, you would have used a database browser. In the left panel, you see that there are tables and procedures and a variety of stuff. How did PG admin 3 know all that? Through a metadata, database metadata feature. So, that is how it is used. Now, uh, earlier uh, today, I told you something about transactions and that you can uh, turn auto commit on or off. So, in um, what does that do? Uh, by default, each SQL statement sent through JDBC in pretty much all databases is treated as a separate transaction, which is committed immediately. But if I want a transaction with just two updates and I want them to be atomic, both occur or neither occur. The way to do it is to treat all of these as one transaction. From JDBC, how do I do it? The first step is to say uh, connection dot set auto commit false. So, once I set auto commit false, SQL statements are not committed automatically. Instead, the subsequent SQL statements after this are all treated as part of one single transaction. So, I can run two, three, how many ever SQL statements I want. And then I have to say either connection dot commit or connection dot rollback. And whatever is appropriate is done. I should warn you though, that even if you say connection dot commit, the database may find some problem. It may find that the, uh, some of the concurrent updates happened, which conflicted with yours. And it may say, sorry, uh, I'm rolling you back. But if you say roll back, it will roll back. Now, if you are done and you want to go back to auto commit, you can say connection dot set auto commit true, which will then commit each transaction immediately. Okay. So, that was a quick overview of JDBC. Um, JDBC is widely used, but equally widely used is the ODBC API, which is the original one on which JDBC is based. And the exact um, you know, calls in the API depends on the language. ODBC is actually made available in Visual Basic in C, C Sharp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So each, depending on the language, the library calls are slightly different. The functionality is the same. ADO.NET is a successor to ODBC, which was introduced by Microsoft, adding a whole bunch of other features to access non-relational data sources also. Uh, there is a small sample of code, which I am not going to cover for now. Uh, if you are interested, you can read it. It looks a, quite a bit like JDBC, but it is slightly different and has uh, some quite a few other features. Then there is embedded SQL, which is uh, which lets you embed SQL code in a programming language uh, without explicitly using calls like we do. Which uh, connection dot prepare statement and so forth. Uh, so, there are uh, several such things. There are SQL standards for embedding SQL in COBOL, C and so forth. And usually, there is a preprocessor, which takes a program, which has embedded SQL, rewrites it. For example, it may take a Java program with embedded SQL and rewrite it into Java code calling JDBC. So, it saves some amount of effort for the programmer. I won't get into the details. I'll also mention that the SQL language we have seen so far is pretty much just declarative. 
there are select from where clauses and a bunch of other related features. But people soon realized that they would like to do more stuff with SQL. So, SQL actually evolved into a full fledged programming language whose goal was not you know doing graphics or something, a programming language which could do complex logic while running in the database system. So, uh, there is something called stored procedures uh, which lets you store a program with imperative constructs in the database and execute it on demand. Now, this imperative language is basically SQL plus a bunch of procedural constructs, uh, loops, if then else and so forth. So, again I do not have time to cover all this in detail, but uh, stored procedures are fairly widely used. Unfortunately, stored procedures, there is a SQL standard for stored procedure syntax, for procedural SQL syntax. The only sad thing is nobody follows the standard. Every database does its own thing. Now, what this means is, if you use stored procedures in Oracle, you are stuck with Oracle. You cannot port your application to any other database, because its language is very different from, let us say the uh, DB2 or the PostgreSQL, each one has its own language. So, there is a danger of lock-in. Certain people say do not use stored procedures because of this, but there are a few places where it is good to have procedural code in the database to carry out certain tasks. For the most part you can do the same thing using a Java program, but there are a few limited cases where you would like a single thing in the database. Uh, then there are SQL functions and table valued functions and procedures, I am going to skip all of those procedural constructs, I have skipped all of those. Let me introduce you very briefly to a few more topics. I do not have time to get into all the details, so I want you to read it up if you are not familiar with it. The first is the notion of a trigger. A trigger is basically a statement that is automatically executed as a side effect of some other update or operation done on a database. Um, so, for example, here is a trigger. Uh, create trigger time slot check 1 after insertion on section. So, whenever there is an insert on the section relation, this piece of code gets invoked. What does this code do? It says referencing new row as n row. So, a row has been inserted, I need a variable which contains the contents of that inserted row. So, that is what this basically declares. It says n row is a variable containing the value of the newly inserted row. And then it says for each row, if the transaction may have inserted a thousand rows, what this says is for each row loop over each row, if the uh, it says when n row dot time slot id is not in, select time slot id from time slot. What is this check doing? It is running a query, which is checking if the time slot id of the newly inserted row is present in the time slot table. If it is present, no problem. If it is not in there, then what does it do? It does a rollback. So, this is enforcing an integrity constraint using a trigger. So, as you can imagine, this particular trigger must run as part of the transaction which is doing the insert, whereby the error is detected while the transaction is running and it rolls back. That is how triggers operate, they run as part of the transaction. Um, of course, this check is only on insert to section. What if I insert successfully, then I go to the time slot table and delete a particular time slot. Now, you have a section which has a time slot which no longer exists. It was there when the section was inserted, it is gone now. What about updates on section? When it is inserted, the time slot was correct, now it was updated to some arbitrary value. So, you can actually modify this to say after insert or update and similarly for delete or update of time slot, I can check if that particular time slot no longer exists in that relation, this is the last tuple with that time slot and it is still referenced from somewhere else, then I roll back. So, I do not have time to discuss this, but go back and uh, read it uh, later on. There are a bunch of other trigger related constructs. Uh, there is another trigger here, which maintains the 
uh, taught credits, the total credits value for each student, every time a grade is allocated to that student. So, when the grade is done by updating takes, it checks if uh, you know this student was newly allocated a grade and then updates total credits. Again, I do not have time to discuss this now, but I will urge you to read it later on. So, triggers can be very useful. Triggers can also be a little dangerous. Uh, there are many applications where you should not be using triggers. Again, I do not have time to discuss it, but go read it up. Uh, it give the, these slides tell you what to do. Okay. So, we are uh, quite a bit beyond time. Um, so, let me just wrap up by saying that the rest of chapter 5 contains several topics. One is a bunch of advanced aggregation features. The first one is a ranking feature. This was a question raised earlier. Uh, how to get the nth tuple or a more general question, if I have a bunch of students in a class, how do I give them ranks? Who is first rank? Who is second rank? So, it can be done using basic SQL constructs, but it is inefficient. Um, so, some of these slides here show you new SQL constructs which were added to simplify the task of assigning ranks and which can be executed very efficiently by the database. Again, I do not have time to discuss this. This slide points out that yes, you can get ranks using basic SQL queries without these features, uh, but the query execution will be very inefficient. How does it do it? Um, this was, I, I posted this on the Moodle thing. If you read it, you will see it there also or read this slide uh, and figure out how it works. I do not have time to discuss it now. Uh, and there is a whole bunch of features for ranking. For example, you can get the rank for each section of a course separately or overall for a course and so forth. And the last topic in uh, this chapter is OLAP for online analytical processing. Uh, we are well out of time. So, I am not going to even try to cover it here, but I urge you to read these slides at least. This is a very quick overview of OLAP. Uh, go read it up to get an idea. If time permits on the last day when I do advanced topics, I will try to cover a bit of OLAP over there. With that, I will uh, stop. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Two questions which were received over chat. Um, what is the exact date format used in the last quiz? Is it year, month, date or any other format? Uh, in the question, it was 2010 30 11. Uh, oh, I, that was an error. Uh, that should have been 2010-1130. So, maybe uh, people recognize this error, which I did not notice and uh, I apologize for that typo. Um, so, the date format by default would be year, month, day. Uh, why not day, month, year? Because US guys use month, day, year, which causes confusion. So, the default is year, month, day in reverse order. You can change it, but that is the default. Um, the next one is, we have a text file which contains 100 student records. We need to insert this in a student table. How do we insert it? The answer is, uh, you can write a small uh, Java program with JDBC to read that file and insert it. Another possibility is, if the file uh, has uh, good uh, formatting with separators such as comma or tab, there, is a, there are tools which are built in to most database systems, including PostgreSQL which can load directly from a file into a relation. Uh, you can see the system manuals for details uh, in uh, uh, PostgreSQL, I think it is called uh, B copy uh, or Oracle, I, I forget. One of those it is B copy, but most databases do provide a bulk load facility uh, where you can directly take a text file which has some separation between uh, columns and load it directly. Uh, the next question is, why can't we write create or replace table uh, as that of trigger or procedure. Uh, create or replace table is an oracle uh, construct. Uh, I do not think it is yet part of standard SQL, although it is obviously a very useful construct. So, it lets you clobber an existing table if it exists, because otherwise if you say create table, the database will say sorry, it already exists. But if you say delete table, the database will say 
if it is not there, it will say does not exist. So, um, the question is why cannot we do it with create table, um, I am not sure why not. Logically, it is a nice feature to have and every database ought to support it. Uh, then finally, can you give an example of implementation of dynamic SQL? JDBC is an example of dynamic SQL. So, we have just discussed this in great detail. Uh, so, you, the question is uh, what is dynamic SQL? Uh, JDBC is an example where you are basically creating strings and passing it to the database uh, as opposed to the SQL query being part of the programming language and being compiled by the compiler. So, that is slightly different. So, what is used in practice today almost always is JDBC, ODBC which are dynamic SQL. Okay, uh, I think I will uh, stop here, thank you and bye.